Good evening. Hi, everyone. Happy Election Day. I hope everybody uh, had time to go out and vote, do their civic duty. So tonight we have Laura Lederman. Uh, she's a data analyst at Measure of America, where she performs quantitative analysis and creates data visualizations with a focus on mapping and geosp geospatial applications. So please welcome Laura. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, and thank you especially to Kim and Bill and Matthew for having me. Um, as Kim said, I'm a data analyst at Measure of America, which maybe tells you a little bit about what I do. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean that I get to travel around the country with a yardstick and a barometer and go measure everything in sight. Uh, instead, I usually, when my friends ask me what I do, I say that I measure how people are doing in America. So Kim found our most recent report, uh, a portrait of New York City, on Twitter and invited us to talk about it. And I'm definitely going to tell you some interesting things from the report, but I'm also going to talk more broadly about our work and how we think about using data to make change and improve people's lives. So let's start with a question. Or maybe it's really a game. On a scale from 0 to 10, how would you rate the well-being of New Yorkers? So 0 is low. 10 is high, we're talking about the range of well-being that is present across the United States, not comparing internationally. So on the bottom of your screen there, oh, it's very small, it's bit.ly slash ux underscore data. You will find a Google form and you can put in your guess. You can give me a number of up to two decimal points and whoever is the closest will get a copy of our report and a poster, though you already got a poster, but certainly a copy of our report. So think about that. You can talk to your neighbor. I'll give you a couple minutes to contemplate how well you think New Yorkers are doing, and go ahead and put in your answer. I'm not going to answer any questions yet. <laughs> give me a thumbs up if you've entered your number. Okay, like 30 more seconds to contemplate. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you that the US score is 5.17. So I don't know if that'll make you think that you are more likely to be right or wrong, um, but let's find out. We're going to go look at what results everybody put in. So. Who put a score that was lower than four? Raise your hand if your score was lower than four. Raise your hand if your score was lower than, keep your hand up and then people add on. Raise your hand if your score was lower than five. Raise your hand if your score was lower than six. Raise your hand if your score was lower than seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so that looked like by my, really great averaging, somewhere around like seven and a half. So the real answer is that the score for New York City is 5.98. So that was probably really difficult. We had a question already, what is well-being? What other questions came up for you as you were trying to do that? It was compared to what, like the US, the world, other mm -hmm. cities? Compared to what, yeah, other cities across the US, yeah. Average or median. Average or median. Other things that you were thinking about when you were trying to decide what kind of score to give? How many years do I have to be in New York to be a New Yorker? <laughs> oh, that's an interesting one. Who counts as a New Yorker? That we have to find New York by Manhattan, but that's tempting because you're in Manhattan. Uh-huh. So New York is really five boroughs, not just Manhattan, for sure. So sort of the question of like, which New Yorkers are we talking about? Yeah. Social, like social class and like does home, homeless people count in this or? Class and do homeless people count? Yeah. Age groups also. Age groups also, yeah. Do New Yorkers rate themselves or are they being rated? Do New Yorkers rate themselves or are they being rated? I can tell that we are in a room with a bunch of nerds, which is great. <laughs> so those are all really fantastic questions. 
Um, and all of these questions are at the heart of what we do. So let's talk about this score. What are we measuring? So the, all of our work is grounded in the concept of human development. This idea was created in the 70s as an alternative to GDP when people sort of realized that GDP is only measuring part of what matters about how a country is doing and wanted a more human focused measure. Um, it's based on Amartya Sen's idea of capabilities, which are basically a person's toolkit for uh, the ability to live a freely chosen life. So there are things like these, on these spokes, I don't know if you can read them, they're yellow on white, um, that are like things like equality before the law and a sustainable environment and religious freedom, things like that. And they're built both by a person's own efforts and by the conditions and institutions around them in the way that eating healthily and having access to stores that sell healthy food are necessary for living a long and healthy life. Um, the concept was used to devise the Human Development Index, which premiered at the UN in 1990 and has become the international gold standard for comparing the well-being of countries. It would be pretty impossible to measure all of these different really abstract kind of ideas, so the index measures three things. It measures a long and healthy life, access to knowledge, and a decent standard of living. So the organization that I work at, Measure of America, was founded 10 years ago to bring that idea to the US, um, to begin to apply that framework to compare different places in the US, different groups of people, as a way to have a more holistic measure for working for change, to have more of a clear understanding of how different groups of people and different places stand relative to each other. Um, it was adapted to the U.S. context with some slightly different indicators. Um, so the way that we measure human development is with life expectancy at birth, educational degree attainment and school enrollment for the education component, and median personal earnings for the income component. Basically then you put them all on a scale from 0 to 10, add them all together, divide by 3, and you end up with one number which is that 5.98, the New York City Human Development Index score. So that's what it is. And that's one piece of what we do at Measure of America, is calculating the HDI for all of these sorts of places, writing reports that look at how different groups of people are doing, taking this sort of baseline assessment. And we also create many other sorts of tools online and other types of research that increase people's understanding of well-being and how we can use data to move forward. Because what we're really talking about is how to get from data to change. And when we talk about change, we mean improvements in the lives of everyday people. So the ability to live like happier, healthier, more freely chosen lives. And there's a lot of ways that this change happens, and there's so many types of people working on it. So let's take a look at some of those types of people that we might be thinking about. I know you're UX designers, you love user personas, so I put some here for you. Um, so we have a citizen proposing an idea for participatory budgeting. If you voted today, you voted on participatory budgeting. And that is the idea that certain districts allocate a portion of money that citizens can propose projects, and then the residents of the district get to vote on how to use the money. Um, a nonprofit making decisions about allocating services or applying for a grant, where to put their next program, how to prove that their program is necessary. And a community board member considering key district issues, planning or rezoning or whatever. Um, all of these people need information. They need data to do what they're doing. But when data looks like this, it can be hard to deal with. So if you're not an expert, it can be really overwhelming. There's a huge amount of open data in this city, which is amazing. This is not to knock any of these amazing providers of data or platforms by which they exist, but it's really all over the place in different formats, different ways, five different versions, and you don't necessarily know what you're looking for, and if you don't know how to calculate what you're trying to calculate, it can be scary. Um, and 
So this is the space that we work in, sort of translating from the raw data to what users are needing, what they are trying to, the questions they're trying to answer, the ways that they're trying to work. Um, so I'm going to talk today about one of each of these sort of ways that we work, a tool and a report, both focused on New York City. So this one is our tool, Data to Go New York City, and this is our most recent report in New York City, a portrait of New York City. <laughs> a lot of New York City. So this is Data to Go. It is a mapping and data visualization tool that brings together federal, state, and city data on a range of indicators that are crucial for understanding well-being in the city. There's about 350 different data points in there, and most of them are publicly available, but they're available on different websites, different sources, different formats, and we bring them all together in one place where people can look at them in a easy-to-use format. Um, they can also overlay points on it, like locations of food pantries or hospitals. So rather than showing you any of the particular data sets on here, you can go play around with it at home, I'm going to talk more about how we think about creating tools like this and sort of what the different features that we are really thinking about when we're trying to make data more accessible. So first is curating data. So 350 indicators, that sounds like a lot, right? But there could be many, 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 many more on this site if we wanted there to be. But there is a first step then of deciding what is important, what should be displayed, what do people need? And so that involves talking with users, talking with people who are trying to solve a problem, talking with these types of users that we talked about earlier, and seeing what is not, what they aren't getting, what isn't meeting their needs, what they are looking for in a tool. Um, we also organize it all into these sort of categories that you can see up here that are the general structure of understanding sort of facets of human development, of a broad look at how people are doing. So things like education, housing, work, wealth, and poverty. Um, and then getting the data itself and transforming it into a form that all goes in here, that's another step. So we do a lot of calculating rates so that we're displaying everything by population so that you can compare against community districts from data sets that were just by raw counts. We do a lot of taking things from databases that are really cool, like I had up there the um, crime complaint data, which is individual incident data, which is really interesting, but you could imagine if somebody's looking for a crime rate, that's not so helpful. Um, and then we think a lot about what to name these things, which seems kind of inconsequential and a little bit under underappreciated. As the person who just spent like two weeks doing this, I can tell you it's really quite a large chunk of what we do is thinking about what is the best way to name this thing and describe it to somebody in a really clear way. So sometimes we write these little explanatory bits like school enrollment, percent of population age three to 24 in school, and we also spend a lot of time writing notes and sources. Um, you probably can't read that. I can't even either. This one says avoidable asthma hospitalizations. The rate of adults per 100,000 hospitalized for asthma whose hospitalizations could have been prevented by quality outpatient care. So that's an interesting one. You might ask some questions. You might want to go to the data and find out what their methodology is. But that's a quick summary of what this data means. Um, and then I also just put this image to mention that one of the things that people are always telling us that they're looking for is the ability to compare their place to other places. How am I doing relative to our community district next door? How am I doing relative to our borough? How are we doing in the, scoop, in the scheme of New York City? So whenever we design tools, we think a lot about how to add elements that contextualize what the data point that the person is looking at relative to what they might care about. Cool. Um, so data to go in action. I'm going to show you, uh, tell you about a couple of ways that people are using the data. Surprise, all those user profiles that we talked about at the beginning are actually actual users of data to go data to go has been being used in participatory budgeting for the process of 
um, determining what the needs of a community are and what sort of proposals people might want to make. Nonprofits use data to go many, many, many different ways for allocating services. For example, um, New York Common Pantry uses it to determine where they should hold their nutrition education programs. So they're looking at things like SNAP enrollment and at people who are eating vegetables and drinking sugary beverages, um, all of which are on data to go. And community boards. Um, Manhattan Community Board 1 did a really comprehensive livability study where they looked at all sorts of things from grocery store prevalence to uh, air quality and a lot of that they were using from data to go. So that's just a couple examples. Um, what we see right here is from a cool project that we did called the Community Portraits where we worked with the Human Services Council and they gave grants to their member organizations to make portraits about an unmet need in their community or kind of a, some sort of issue or sort of advocacy about the thing that they're working on. And they used data to go for that. Um, and I don't think the internet is probably still working again, but there's an interesting video that maybe we'll pull up later to show you about it. It's really interesting to hear them talk in their own words about how they use data. So these are a few ways that we sort of take the tool from just being a, something on the internet to really being something that people use. So we give a lot of demos, we uh, do projects like this where people are thinking about how to use the data, what they can do with it. So that's great. Data to go is great. There's certain people who really want to explore. They know what they're looking for. I'm going to find this data, or they really want to explore, dig in, see what's there, dig around, look at their community district. Um, but there's other people who really want a written report, who want to read something, have the findings presented to them. It serves a different use to be able to sort of go to a community board meeting, say, see, and say, say, and say that this finding is in this report, see? As opposed to, I found this data set and I decided that I think that it means this. Um, and so reports are a place, so we don't think of the two as in opposition, but really complementary to each other and serving different needs. Um, the report is a place where you can present findings. This is what the data says, here it is. It's a place where you can go more in depth and look at other research and contextualize it in the context of what other social science research has found and really tell a compelling story about an issue. And it's a place where you can set goals, sort of take a baseline and set goals, and it's really useful for bringing people together on a particular issue. So it's a simple metric, but it has a lot of power to help people work across sectors, to rally around a common goal, um, and to compare how their community is compared to other places around the country. So I'm gonna dive back into the data. So that 5.98 didn't really mean that much to you earlier today. Right? And that's because the power in this sort of a metric is when you calculate it for groups of people and are able to compare and see gaps. So when you break down the New York City population by race, you start to see that the scores are quite different. It ranges from 4.58 for Latinos to 7.63. So a reminder, zero is low, 10 is high, it includes health, education, and income. So what it's saying is that, on average, white New Yorkers have higher incomes, higher education, and live longer in aggregate. Um, and then you break it down more, and you look at it by geography, and you have another interesting lens. Um, Asians are the group that have the most difference between the boroughs in New York City. So the score for Asians who are living in Brooklyn is 5.8 compared to almost nine for Asians who are living in Manhattan, which points to different groups of people, right? People in terms of ethnicity, in terms of time of immigration to the US, in terms of education level, all of these things that are dependent on where people live, or, or rather that where people live reflects that. And then you look at it uh, on a map and you can see different 
trends as well. Um, a range from 2.71 in Claremont Bathgate in the Bronx to 9.34 on the Upper East Side. Um, so these are like a few of the ways that in the reports we begin to break down the data. And the basic structure is that we talk about the overall scores like this, sort of painting a picture, this is the lay of the land, and then dig into health, education, and income, and really add other information, contextualize it, explain why things might be the way that they are without saying necessarily this is why it is, but um, some background information. So I'm gonna show you a couple of interesting things from the reports, and also while I'm doing that, dig, sort of show you behind the scenes, how we got there, why we chose the things that we did. So, health. So, health is one that I really like. So remember, this is a measure, is measured by life expectancy at birth. So that is uh, how long people are living on average in a place. And I like it because it's really tangible. Like, you can understand how long people live. That's really understandable. But I don't think it's something that we think about as varying systemically so much. We think, oh, okay, this person lived long, this person didn't live long. As much as we think about like income, you know, race has an impact on income, maybe we don't think so much about race or where you live has an impact on how, you, how long you live. But um, as you can maybe read here, the range varies from 73.3 years in Southwest Newark to 90.4 years in Southeast Westchester, which is like Rye area. So that's a 17 year gap. Um, that's like a fifth of somebody's life that they are living longer. Um, so that ha is, is really significant. And in the report, health is, health is a complicated one because there's so many factors that influence, right? So we talk a lot about some of the social determinants of health, so the ways that different structures around you can influence your health. We talk about um, leading causes of death. But one of the things we like to do is look at places that are demographically pretty similar, but have really different life expectancy outcomes as a way to try and understand what might be going on there. So one of those is uh, Latinos in Queens versus Latinos in the Bronx, where Latinos in, the Bron Latinos in Queens live about seven years longer than Latinos in the Bronx, um, which points to something that is uh, called the Latino health paradox. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Let's see if you can figure it out. Do you think that Latino New Yorkers or white New Yorkers live longer on average? Raise your hand if you think Latino. Got a few, raise your hand if you think white. Also a few, I think that one was a little bit higher. So the ones of you who said Latino, are correct. Um, Latinos live uh, a few years longer than white New Yorkers, um, not as long as Asian New Yorkers, and all three are longer than black New Yorkers. Um, and this is called the Latino health paradox. It's, a, it's uh, something that we see across the country, and the paradox is that in general, worldwide, life expectancy increases with education. Places, places and people where there are more education tend to live longer. Um, with Latinos in the US, Latinos are a group that have fairly low educational outcomes compared to other groups, yet they're living longer than groups that have more education. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that that are pointed to. There's a lot of research on this. Um, there's no, as with all issues, no firm conclusions, but some of the, issue, some of the things that are pointed to is lower rates of smoking amongst Latino communities, and um, the fact that immigrants live longer than native-born Americans. So that's something that is also seen across the country, that immigrants have longer life expectancy. Though there's some interesting research about how that advantage wears off a little bit the longer that you've been in the US, and people point to that in terms of like adopting poor American health behaviors and eating patterns. Um, so, that makes sense for this uh, phenomenon that I s explained about Latinos in the Bronx and in Queens, in that Latinos in Queens are more recent immigrants. And so it makes sense that they're living a little bit longer. Um, let's see. 
think we're doing okay on time. We'll not skip this slide. So this is earnings. Oh, save your questions for the end. I'm gonna take lots of questions at the end. Um, one interesting thing about earnings is that Asians are the only group if, the only racial group that have lower earnings in New York City than they do in the US overall, um, which also points to groups of people, times of immigration, all of that. Um, and you might see that the, the white earnings in New York are like quite high. Um, another way to think about it might be that New York is a really expensive place and that these other groups of people have earnings that are not high enough. Um, could be interesting, a, sort of a different framing. Um, and then we break it down a lot by, by borough. I'm not gonna tell you all the things that I see in this chart, but there's lots of different interesting things. But one of the things I wanna draw your attention to is this little line on the side here. So one of the things that we really think about doing is as much as possible breaking things down even further because we're talking about lots of people, right? So to understand what is going on better, breaking things down by uh, racial subgroups is one way that we do that. So you can see that there's a big gap in, or a quite wide range in earnings um, between Bangladeshi New Yorkers who make about $24,000 and Japanese New Yorkers who make about $51,000. Um, so a lot of the time how we decide what to include is just sort of an overview of the data. But then sometimes something really stands out to us. We see an outlier and we want to dig in further to why it is, to decide why it is the way it is. Um, so this one is an example of that. We saw that there was a neighborhood in New Jersey where Latino educational attainment was a lot higher than in other similar demographic neighborhoods like Jackson Heights and North Corona. So that led into some research about high school graduation rates in the area and found out that the Latino graduation rates there were higher or were comparable or higher to those of white students in New York City, which was really quite interesting. Um, and I was really excited to slow, show you this slide because I found my rough draft picture on the bottom, buried on my desk um, to show you a little bit behind the scenes of the process. So the, the section got written, it had this table in it and then we went through and we said, okay, this is not gonna be a table, definitely not gonna be a table, what do we want it to be? And we made this uh, sketch of this bar graph and it's got all these lines on it. There's the NYC Asian one, the NYC white one, the NYC black one, the NYC Latino one. It's got like really long titles down here that say Latino in every one. And it turned into this, which ended up with just these two lines because that's the story that we're trying to tell. Um, and much more simple down here, and an explanatory title. So that's something that we try and do a lot, is to write a title for a graphic that tells you what you're seeing. Um, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, but it's, it's an interesting technique to really draw the reader into what they should be looking at. And this happens in the offices of our lovely design partners, Humantific, um, who we've worked with since our first human development report 10 years ago and who've been really instrumental in developing our visual language and thinking about how to communicate these complex ideas. So there we are at work, it's, it's happening, we're editing things. Um, so that's all decisions that are guided by the data. This is something that was interesting in the data that we wanted to look at. We also get a lot of input from people that help shape what is included. We have an advisory panel for every report that we do that includes uh, experts, from, or experts and people working in fields across the board. Um, a lot from community organizations, from, excuse me, from data to go users. So like the community portraits that I mentioned earlier were really important way for us to understand what issues people wanted more research on from where they were looking at. Um, and just sort of what's generally in the air in New York City. So right now, housing, transportation, <coughs> gentrification, immigration, these are all covered in the report because they're the issues that are most salient right now amongst New Yorkers. Um, so when we do one of these deep dives, it's also always connected to human development and equity and gaps. And so 
I wanted to talk about this one that was a little inset section about the color of transportation, so about who is using what forms of transportation. Um, this is in the whole metro area, which includes like Connecticut and New Jersey, the northern half of New Jersey and Long Island. The report has a sort of a metro area section and then some New York City sections. Um, so just off the bat, you can see this first graph is the average commute time by race. And you can see that black New Yorkers have, or black residents of the New York metro area <laughs> have 40 minute commutes compared to white New Yorkers, metro area residents who have 33 minute commutes, which doesn't seem like a big difference, right? But when you think about that, that's 14 minutes a day, which turns into about five hours a month longer that you're spending commuting, which is a pretty big difference. Um, it's also disproportionately likely that black New Yorkers and Latino New Yorkers are commuting on the bus. So in this city, they um, make up less than half of commuters, but 60% of people on the bus. So disproportionately, black and Latino workers are commuting on the bus. And uh, outside of New York City, it's even more pronounced. So people who are taking the bus in their own county, like on the local county transportation bus in their county, 77% are black or Latino. Um, so that matters because that's a form of transportation that tends to be slower, tends to be more crowded, tends to be less frequent, tends to be less reliable compared to people who might be taking the train into the city. Um, so even though train commuters have the longest commute, it's comfortable, you usually get a seat, you can do some work. Um, and people who are taking the train are 80% of them work in management or sales and office jobs. So, um, just like uh, an interesting snapshot of our transportation systems and what the implications of funding certain ones, of developing further certain ones are. Um, one other interesting thing was that we saw that uh, inside and outside the city can have different contexts, right? So in the city, uh, white New Yorkers are the most likely to walk to work, whereas outside of the city, they're the least likely, where Latinos are the most likely. So inside the city, walking to work is like a privilege, right? You can live near enough to your job in order to be able to walk to work. Whereas outside the city, walking to work is most likely not a privilege or more likely to be happening because you don't have another option, because you don't have access to a car. Um, outside the city, disproportionately, everybody is driving. So some many interesting tidbits. So finally, one challenge of this type of report is that it's really a snapshot in time. It's Portrait of New York City 2018. But New York, like all metro areas, is really rapidly shifting, changing, dynamic, things are happening. So one way that we get at that is that we have a little bit of some, a little bit of context. We have some historical stuff at the beginning, and we also made this map that shows some information about how um, neighborhoods have changed over the last 16 years and showing which racial groups have increased in the neighborhood and decreased. And this is another one that went through a long uh, revision process. At first we had just some maps with percentage change and it was really hard to tell because percent change, if you're going up or down, they're not equivalent. So we switched it to percentage point change and we added these little examples and these sentences to help really show the reader what it is we're talking about, give them an example, tell them what they're looking at. Great. So Portrait of New York City is pretty new. It doesn't yet, uh, it, it came out in June, so there aren't a ton of examples of how people are using it yet. We're still really in the process of disseminating it and working with people who might use it. Um, we have been talking with people at the planning department about their regional planning and how the regional data could be useful for that. Um, but I wanted to give you a couple examples of how other reports that we have done have created change and been used. So the, uh, in 2014, we did a portrait of Sonoma County and it was a really collaborative 
process that brought together people from across the county and really every county department was on board and really uh, using the report. And so one of the things that came out of it was that they implemented a change to their smoke, their secondhand smoke ordinance to include e-cigarettes because of some findings about smoking rates in the county and they also uh, changed a few other policies about tobacco. Um, our most recent report before this one was a portrait of Los Angeles County and there we found that parks, park need, so like how much access people have to parks and how good those parks are is really tied to the HDI score of their neighborhood. Um, this little chart right here. If you have a low human development score, you're more likely to have very high park need, and then if you have a high human development score, you're less likely to have very high park need. So better parks if you have more human development, higher human development score. Um, and so they're using that to really evaluate where they should be focusing, where to prioritize park improvements and uh, increased funding for parks. And then this last example right here, actually I have two more. This one is about, um, one of the findings was that many of the communities with the lowest HDI scores are all along this highway, I-710, which is really busy, really polluted, and um, also the vast majority of these neighborhoods are like over 80% black and Latino. And so there's been some efforts to do some collaboration between these cities and neighborhoods and really focus on environmental issues in the neighborhood and do some more collaborative work together. And the last one that I wanted to mention is that from uh, the portrait of LA, it was used in some testimony about early childhood education and as a result of that and many other people's work over a long time there are now 16 new early childhood learning centers in the district this year so that was an exciting one more preschools um, so just to wrap up um, the title of this talk was harnessing data and design to improve communities so um, I wanted to remind ourselves of a few of the points that I talked about, summarize, and then think about that a little bit more. So we're, one of the things we really focus on is working with partners from beginning to end. We really want to have reports that are being used, that are not sitting on a shelf. And so in order to do that, you have to know what people need, you have to work with them to use it, and along that entire process. Um, find out what users need, um, both in terms of data to go and in terms of reports, thinking about how to identify what the gaps are in tools, how to increase people's data uh, availability and use. Ground in previous research, so one of the really things that we spend a lot of time on when we're making the reports is looking, literature review, looking at what everybody else has said about these topics, how we can kind of learn something from the data based on what other people have already found. Um, simplify, 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 probably simplify some more. Um, it's too complicated. You, as a person who works with data, I constantly overestimate what is complicated. And so remembering that you want to make a clear story, a clear name, a clear description that your grandma could understand, that anyone could understand, not to underestimate the data literacy of your grandma, but... <laughs> um, and make data user-friendly and accessible via clear design. So that, that's the whole thing, right? Um, no, no particular answers on how to do that exactly, but really focusing on the ways that design can help make data clear and easy to use. So the title of this talk was Harnessing Data and Design to Improve Communities. Um, whose communities? Who's doing the improving? To me, it's not like we're coming here and we're going to improve your community with this data plop. Um, it's really about providing tools that give people access to understanding their experience, to contextualizing it, to understand what's going on holistically, and advocate for solutions themselves. So to me, the work that I want to be doing is about the power of data accessibility as a tool for self-advocacy, that 
data should not be something that just sits on a shelf that only certain people can have access to and understand, but that it should be something that anyone can use and can use it to understand how their life relates to the world around them and to really take steps to improve their own communities. So I wanted to read a quote that was in this video that I didn't show you, so it's perfect. Um, that is from a, someone who works at Brooklyn Community Services. For organizations like Brooklyn Community Services that are on the front lines of addressing poverty in New York City, we all like to be able to prove our case. Also, because Data2Go is so user-friendly, it allows us to empower the people that we serve to learn how to use the data on their own and really be able to advocate for themselves. So that, to me, sums up what we're trying to do. So thank you so much, and I will take lots of questions. Much. It was um, such a beautiful and powerful uh, presentation. Um, it's my question is not only from you, but in general uh, from myself and everyone. Is that uh, when we are talking about data, there is usually uh, a minority and marginalized people who fall from that, and that's why they're called marginalized because even in data they are invisible. And what I noticed, for example that we are still uh, using data for gender binary definition, like man and woman, but New York City is one of the like, queerest um, cities in the world, and still we, um, trans people, intersex people, queer people are not being um, visualized in, in that. And so my question is, um, what infrastructure do you have to be reminded of those marginalized communities and minorities that uh, usually fall off from that um, uh, borders? Yeah, that's a really great, really important question. Um, because as you say, there is a limit, right? The data that is collected, most of our data comes from the American Community Survey. The American Community Survey only offers two genders. The American Community Survey doesn't ask anything about sexuality. Um, so, as your question so perfectly articulated, how can we both sort of present the data while also, I would say, advocate for changes in the way that the data is collected and also point out to people the gaps in the data and the gaps in what we're able to understand because of that. Um, so, I think the way that I think about it is that uh, we, yes, should advocate for this data being collected. Well, it's complicated, but you know, for, for the gender option to not just have two boxes, for example. Um, and then in the reports, we often will point out, you know, this is what's missing. Like, there is no data on this, and so we can't understand that. And then also to try and pull in whatever sources, even if it's not from data that we can calculate an index score for, um, to have some information. So in the uh, health section, there's some data from the New York City Health Department survey on, oh, I found it, that was easy. New York City Health and Nutrition Examination Survey and the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which does ask people about their sexuality. And so we have a little bit of section about LGBT mental health disparities and health issues, um, asking about fair or poor mental health and depressive symptoms and considering suicide. And so we always say, like, this data doesn't exist. We can't calculate our index by it. This is what we can say, and this is the problem that this gap provides. Um, yeah, I would advocate for everyone to think about the ways that they, in their own data management practices. There's a lot of ways we can, can change this, right? Um, I have a friend who just wrote a blog post about, as a database administrator, how can you have better gender questions and better gender boxes? And so thinking about, as people who work with data, it's really easy to get sort of in those boxes because that's what is on your screen, but to think about what are the ways that we can fight against that. Yeah, thank you. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks so much. This is wonderful work that you guys are doing to kind of provide this uh, wrapper. And it's, 
layer in front of the awesome open data that's out there. Um, I, I have a question that's made more, uh, since we are in a room and a meetup called UX and Design, um, I was wondering if, uh, first part of my question, if you could speak a little bit to the uh, kind of design process, you know, it's, you guys probably didn't get it right the first time around, right? Like, you know, how, what's that cycle like? Like, how are you kind of addressing heterogeneous uh, use cases, you know, people who might want to use uh, the tool, the report in different ways. I mean, how do you how do you think about that? How do you iterate on that? Um, and the second part is is was there any sort of like surprising uh, learnings that you had, uh, your the organization had kind of uh, early on um, that you know we might not we might not otherwise know. About? Hmm. Okay. So the first one, um, yes, we iterate a lot. Um, Data to Go is currently in its third year, I think, I want to say, um, that it has been uh, updated and refreshed. Um, so one, in terms of use cases that people have, one thing that I would, would say is that we're always doing demonstrations of data to go So we go to organizations, we demo to them how they can use it, and those are amazing for finding out what people want that isn't in there and what sort of ways that they would want to use it. Um, and this is actually a great segue for a plug that we have a new tool coming out, which is data to go Health, um, that has more health data. And so what, sometimes the answer is we create a new thing based on what people are asking for. Um, another way that we think about that is just um, like in terms of reviewing how, how people are using it and how it works and adding new functionality and changing things up. One of the things that we do is build these tools for different communities. So we've built one for Santa Barbara and uh, we, in doing that process, saw, oh, there's this really awful thing where this like box that's in the corner, you can never minimize it. And they were like, that's a big problem. So we built a way to minimize it and then we implemented that into New York City. Um, so that's a, a little piece of the answer. Um, in terms of reports, it's really about like 12 versions, you know, like we write it and we edit it and we make graphics and we make graphics again and again and again in terms of um, some, some testing and some looking at it. Sometimes we ask some, one of our colleagues who doesn't work on our program like, tell me what this graph says. And then they're like, no idea. So then you make it again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they give you a little more feedback than that, but <laughs> yeah, and then the second question, um, something that we learned that is surprising. Do you mean in terms of like data or in terms of like how we do what we do? Uh, I, I meant more from like UX, UX. like the way that people use it. The way that people use it. Yeah, I think what I would say is that when Measure of America started, there was this idea that like, this data just isn't here. If we just calculated the human development index and saw everybody saw how big the gaps were, they would like change. Like people would act on the data. We just have to show people the truth and then things will happen. Um, and so we made this report for across the country, calculated the, the human development scores for every state and all the racial groups and made this like big book. And then realize that that's not how change is going to happen, sort of. That's not how it's going to get adopted. And so we've moved a lot more to doing more local reports um, where people are asking for them and where people are going to use them and where we can be involved along the whole process of figuring out what the need is and producing the report and helping with dissemination and using the report in the end. So I'd say that is like the main shift in our work um, from a, that sort of perspective. Hi. Hi. So you have a lot of results. You have the data. You have everything. So how could you? How do you communicate with people? How do you share your report? So the report has big, has small. When you share. What kind of tool, what kind of way did you use for a large research? So the research could take like a month to finish and it's, it could be like a hundred page. How did you 
share that? Or small report, it could be just one or two pages. Mm -hmm. How did you share that? And how did you give people <laughs> highlights when they don't have the time to digest mm -hmm. the entire report? Yeah. Those are great questions also. Yeah, like who's going to read this uh, 229 page thing? Probably nobody besides us. Um, I haven't even read the whole thing, to be honest, probably. Um, some of the ways that we do that um, is through presentations. So we'll give presentations that are like, these are the five most interesting findings from the report. Um, another way we did that was through fact sheets. So we made fact sheets for, there were like two pagers um, on each of the sections, so HDI Health Education and Income for both the metro area and New York City, as well as for each of the region. So not, not by topic, but like a fact sheet for Connecticut, and a fact sheet for New Jersey, and a fact sheet for Long Island. I think a fact sheet for each of the boroughs. I don't know, a lot of fact sheets that were like, here's some interesting findings that you might be interested in, in your area, or in your line of work. Um, we also have some interactive maps that we um, share with it, so an interactive map version of the HDI map. Um, we made these posters that um, show your HDI, show the HDI scores, but instead of being labeled by neighborhood, they're labeled by subway stop. <coughs> and so it's like a subway map, but it has HDI on it instead as a way of like, getting people to think about it because they think in terms of riding the subway more. They can locate themselves more in terms of riding the subway. Um, those are some ways that we share things. On social media is another way we share things. Um, yeah, talk to me more later. I'm sure I will come up with more ways. <laughs> I have a question about how kind of enacting change and basically when you go from a report or a fact sheet to changing communities to looking at environmental building parks or whatever it happens yeah. to be. What do you think are some of the key ingredients from somebody seeing that to actually doing something? What does that take? That's a big question. Do you have yeah. the answer? <laughs> do I have the answer? Um, no, I definitely don't have the answer. Um, I think that um, one of the, the things that has been really interesting for me to see with the reports is um, the way that having like a thing that multiple departments or multiple people are all referencing is like really helpful in that like if they there are multiple, sort of if it becomes a, a known reference and a known thing that people can use and a common goal and a common sort of way of aligning work, um, it helps to make change and that everybody, everybody's on board with like, we're all trying to focus on the low HDI areas or we're all trying to implement these recommendations. Um, but I would say like that happened really well in Sonoma and in Los Angeles because they were reports commissioned by the county and by departments in the county. And so they were looking for that, right? They were looking for something to help work across sectors in their government. Um, I think more broadly, um, stories are really powerful and stories by people who are affected by the issue that they're trying to change combined with the piece that is the data that gives the context. Um, yeah, I think that's my answer. <laughs> In any of your studies, have you taken on more specialized um, areas in the life of, say, New Yorkers, like public housing or um, you know, how New York City benchmarks against other cities across the nation, um, as opposed to just the general, some of these areas look more general, but that is something that's very visible in the media right now, and um, just wondering if there's uh, data that sort of quantifies the quality of life there compared to other parts of the country, as the public's education just seems to be more in visual, how it looks, 
and the conditions, but I think it would be helpful to get funding to have more of this kind of uh, data. Yeah, yeah, um, we, so it would be great to look more closely at public housing. One of the ways that we do that um, is by looking at sort of where, I'm trying to find another section to show you here, um, where public housing is located and what are some of the, the social issues in those areas. So there's a page right here that is about asthma and housing that has uh, a map with the NYCHA developments on it and asthma hospitalization rates and um, they overlap pretty, pretty closely. Um, and so it's something that will scatter in, um, but not something that we've done like a comprehensive report on. Um, that's also one of the things that's available on data to go is the locations of NYCHA, um, which is a tool, is a feature that I think is really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I think it would be really interesting to do a report on specifically on public housing residents. Hi, um, I'm, I'm curious to know um, what are the sources of funding that keep um, data to go going? It's a good question. Um, so, data to go is funded by the Helmsley Charitable Trust, um, it, it, as well as this report. Um, so, large grant funding um, from a foundation. We're a part of the Social Science Research Council, um, which is a nonprofit. So, we get grants to do our work mostly. Um, in this case, also in other cases, people will, it's more like running a business. People are hiring us to do particular things. Um, the Los Angeles report was, as I said, commissioned by the county and then they went and fundraised themselves, sort of, and it was funded by 13 different foundations all contributing money to it, um, which also speaks to the like sort of cross-sector desire for it. Hi, thanks. Um, I think one thing that really comes through is the, uh, the beauty of the design work that's done. Um, I mean, what you shared, but also uh, some of the screenshots. I was curious what uh, data to go is built on top of. Um, if it's uh, Tableau dashboards, custom JavaScript library, I'm just curious what the stack looks like. Yeah, um, data to go is a custom piece of software. It is um, built on Leaflet, is what the mapping is done on. It's got a lot of D3 charts in it, but it's built like from the ground up. Um, and it was designed by, uh, what is Rostin's last name? I don't know, by Rostin. Um, you can look it up on data to go He's a great designer. Um, and uh, the reports are all designed by Humantific, which is a um, date, what do they call themselves? A sense-making for change-making firm that is in Chelsea, and they are amazing and lovely. <laughs> yeah. uh, Wu is Rostin's last name, Rostin Wu. <laughs> so you talked a lot about um, finding out really what your users need and then working with the, uh, your partners and advisory boards throughout the process. Could you talk about um, the methodologies that you use to kind of understand what you, the users need? Like are you doing client interviews or like data point card sorting? And, and then what does it look like um, after you've done that initial research? Like are you going back and then like getting their input and feedback as you start to build? Your reports? Yeah, um, so usually for a report we'll put together an advisory board of like 20 people or so who usually are more less technical more in the like service sector in the in the sectors that will use the t report um, and we start by talking to them about what some of the issues are, what some uh, data that they would like, um, and then they're involved throughout the process. So we present to them every few months about where we are and um, what we've found and get their feedback. It's a great place for hearing like, why haven't you talked about this yet? Um, and hearing sort of their reactions to the way that we're talking about it. Um, 
So there's a section in here about immigration or immigrants outside of the city, so like immigration to the suburbs. That was uh, an idea brought to us by one of our advisory panel members talking about how people think about immigrants only as coming to New York City, but so many immigrants now are moving straight to the suburbs. Um, and so that's more for a report, right? It's more about like hearing about the issues, getting feedback. Sometimes we will, um, if we have a particular section that we really want some expertise on, we'll reach out to somebody particularly. Um, there's a section about uh, rent costs in here that we consulted with the Citizens Housing and Planning Committee. That's wrong, but <laughs> a nonprofit that works on housing. Um, and they, we ran some drafts by them, talked to them about data, about you know why weren't we doing it this way, why should we do it that way. Um, in terms of the tools, um, we don't do like necessarily sort of your traditional full stack of user testing, um, but we do a lot of this sort of interviews with people um, and a lot of like showing of the demo version and beta version and seeing how they use it and seeing what's working and not working. Um, once again, just to sort of like, just echo everybody else, this was really fantastic, so thank you for this. Um, two questions, one I think is short and two is maybe a little bit longer. So the first is what is the highest city level HDI? I imagine it's not 10. New York is six. I, I'm curious who is the highest. And if you don't know specifically, maybe what the ballpark is, if it's like eight or eight and a half or seven and a half. Uh -huh. and the second is, um, I'm really curious about um, the, uh, the health metric, so an estimated birth rate. How do you deal, I imagine that things like wealth and education level are part of that. How do you kind of deal with conflating variables in the analysis? Because I imagine it's hard to kind of parse out likely a tangled web of data that you're playing in. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that's a really great point that city, so first one, cities are a lot of people, right? So they average out, they wash out a little bit. So there certainly is no city that is 10. Um, there are neighborhoods within cities, like for example, we saw that the Upper East Side is like 9.3 something. Um, and there are places in Los Angeles, neighborhoods in Los Angeles that are like 2.5 or something like that, um, as well as in New York, but there's a few that are slightly lower in Los Angeles. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what the highest city is. Um, we haven't, also we haven't calculated HDI by city in a little while, um, but if you go to our website, it's there. Um, I think it's from like 2013. Um, and the second question, um, so life expectancy at birth, yeah, it, how, how long somebody's living is influenced by so many things. So um, I guess what I'd say is we don't try to pinpoint why it is the way it is exactly, um, but rather to offer some contextual information. So we focus really on the social determinants of health framework, which is the idea that health is not just about like getting a disease or like your own behavior, um, but that it's contributed to by your family and your neighborhood and your society. Um, there's a nice little diagram about it in here. Um, <laughs> and sort of focus more on like some of the issues. So there's a section um, on leading causes of death um, that points out some of the, by race, it points out some of the, the causes of death that are higher among certain racial groups that are like disproportionately high. Um, and talks about um, some of, then there's sort of like a section of like, what will it take to improve these things that talks a lot about like homicide and poverty and uh, workplace hazards and health risk behaviors and racism and re inequality and residential segregation. So those, this is sort of more how we contextualize it, um, I'd say, yeah. All right, so thank you so much, Laura, for a fantastic talk. And for those of you who are interested in the report, 
there are copies of it, um, I think. There's like probably 20 or so. Um, we'll put them on the table. There's also posters aplenty for everyone. Um, and the report is available online as a PDF for free on our website. Also, if you like want a box of them for your organization, if you're a nonprofit, we'll send you a box. If you're not, you can buy it on Amazon. Um, <laughs> you should also look at all the other things that are on our website. <laughs> And so our next event will be back here on December 4th, and our very own Matt Weber, the founder of UX and Data, will be talking about the UX and Data of Analytical Apps, uh, which is a class taught at Columbia University's Master of Science in Applied Analytics program, uh, where he's a lecturer and class designer. Uh, the class has worked with Google, the United Nations, the City of New York, Bloomberg, and Disney to design solutions to make data more accessible to the masses. And he'll be walking us through that class. So I hope to see you here uh, on December 4th. Uh, have a great night, and uh, hope to see you again. <laughs>